So good morning and welcome once again to our meeting this Saturday, December the 11th. And let me share my screen for a few announcements. Okay, uh, let's see. Great, so everyone should be able to see that now and I will proceed. So we gratefully acknowledge the traditional custodians of Shawalakin, the Hokuminam speaking peoples who hunted and gathered in this area, respecting their caring connections to each other and the places where we live, work and play. And we are part of the larger world of Rotary, but we're a brand new Rotary Club. We chartered just in June of this year, and we are the first eco club of its kind in Canada. And we join a couple of dozen Rotary eco clubs around the world. So we're all on this wonderful learning curve and this wonderful opportunity of making a difference in our environment and connecting people to nature. We practice the four-way test, that's what you see in the lower left part of the screen, of the things we think, say, or do, we ask ourselves, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? We invite you to participate and even have fun in the Zoom meeting. So you can use the chat, you can raise your hand and react as the speaker's talking. We are listening, asking questions and taking notes. And that's part of the process is sharing the recording with the people who couldn't be here today at this uh, brightener, bushy tailed early time of 8 a.m. So today's topic is clear the tracks for the Salish Sea Connector Trail. And I love that one descriptive title David's given it. And our presenter today is David Slade. He's a director at the Friends of Rail Trail Vancouver Island um, group. And he has a wonderful background. Let me just, I, I tried to summarize it on the screen for you, but I'll read the bio that he's given me. David was born and raised as a couch and valley boy and has recently retired from drill well enterprises. It's the third generation water well drilling family business that he was a part of and, and founded, I, I believe like the current iteration of it, past president of the BC Groundwater Association, founding and current member of the Cowishan Watershed Board, He's a 20 year member and current chair of the Mill Bay Fire Department trustees, as well as finding time for small scale organic farming and climate change and sustainability activist um, engagement. And best of all, and I think this is where we all can relate, he is a deeply concerned grandfather. And so he's looking ahead to the generations to come. So thank you very much, David, for being with us today. And uh, just I'll give you a couple minutes to uh, sort of collect your opening statements because I have a quick announcement here. So our club is in a growth phase and we are trying to facilitate connections. So I thought I'd share this slide. But this is what we're all about. So if you like what you see today, please consider joining us and lending your voice to the work. So together we grow. We are looking for like-minded people who have a heart for volunteering, but most importantly have um, experiences and gifts of time and talents that they would like to share and together we can grow and together we can transform and make a difference. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for allowing me to share that opportunity and to play that game of what do what what do we get to do as as Rotary members. So we will continue to play that after the presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing now and turn it over to our guest presenter, David Slade. So David, you'll be spotlighted in just a moment here. And can everyone see David's screen? There we go. Um, thank you so very much, Kim. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I yes. can. Okay, very well, good, very good. And my screen's showing. The, <clears throat> when I first signed on this morning, I uh, I told Kim that I had done a presentation to the South Couch and Rotary Club earlier this week, and I got to this stage, and everything was perfect. And then my screen froze, and I had to actually sign out, reboot, and sign everything back in again. So we're hoping that that doesn't happen again today. 
Um, my uh, my IT guy happens to be my ten year old grandchild, and he's not he's not here right now to help me. So, so hopefully things will go more smoothly today. So I want to start out by saying that I am not a train hater um, uh, because there are people in our group that have been accused of being train haters, and I advocated for years to get the train running again on the ENN rail bed uh, as a as a active not as an active transportation corridor, but as a as an active transporter of goods and people uh, up and down the island corridor, and and I guess I've uh, I've just finally reached the point where I don't believe that that's going to be happening. There's ten years have passed now, and a CEO has making uh, three figure salary has been trying to resurrect the ENN, and there is just no appetite for it from senior government. And I'm going to go into some details as to why that is the case. But I think that opportunity is passing us by. Um, there, is, there is much benefit to be had from, from this corridor and it is just rusting and rotting away before our eyes. So, uh, so I'll move into the presentation now. Everybody hold your breath. Hey, look at that, it worked. <laughs> so um, could we save questions for the end? Um, hopefully I'll answer most of the questions that might occur during the presentation, but if we can save them till the end, that would be great. <clears throat> so who are we? Um, Fort VI is our acronym, um, Friends of Rails to Trails Vancouver Island. So created in 2018 as a nonprofit, and our purpose is to encourage the repurposing of the ENN rail line from Langford to Victoria, uh, from, sorry, from Langford to Courtney. Our vision statement is to encourage the preservation and protection of the ENN rail corridor and perpetuity as a contiguous, multi-use active transportation network connecting communities First Na and First Nations on Vancouver Island. And we were able to easily get 1,500 people in 2018 to support that vision and a petition that we presented to the legislature. And the name is something that I'm, I'm just hoping will resonate with people, but we as a group <clears throat> ultimately will have no role in choosing that name. Perhaps, uh, perhaps it will be a contest one day to choose the name or, or assigned to um, be decided by the various First Nations that, that share the course of the corridor. But uh, the Salish Coast Connector Trail is one that seems to have a nice ring to it. Um, on the other end of the tracks is a group called the Island Corridor Foundation who deserve a great deal of credit for preserving this corridor. Um, many rail corridors and, and some on Vancouver Island in fact have been lost and, and sectioned up and, and sold. And, and so it was a, a great vision to uh, form a nonprofit uh, that became a charity, uh, organize all of the First Nations whose territories the the rail corridor goes through and the regional districts and, and form the ICF, which ended up the owners of the rail bed in exchange for a very significant tax credit. So it was basically donated to the ICF for a tax credit. And there's a contractual relationship with Southern Rail of Vancouver Island. So that's an American company, US-based company, and, and ICF does not have the expertise to operate a railroad. So the notion is that if a railroad ever started to operate again, um, particularly the commercial freight aspect of it, uh, profits from such operations would go to a US-based company. So the vision of the ICF is to preserve and use the corridor in perpetuity as one continuous corridor to connect and benefit all island communities and First Nations along the corridor. So you can see the island corridors Foundation, the ICF, their vision is not so different than our vision, except that their vision includes trains almost exclusively. So, so they don't want the tracks removed. They want to see trains run on that on that rail bed again. And again, I want to highlight that I am not against trains. I think they're a great way to move people and a great way to move freight, but there has to be a there has to be an argument. There has to be a business case for it. So it was built well over 100 years ago. Um, it was built as a slow speed rail. It was designed for, for industry. And because it has so many curves and goes through so many communities, it really is not practical to consider it as a high speed rail. 
So you're not going to see bullet trains run on, on this rail bed um, because it is way too curvy and it goes through too many communities. So it's 224 kilometers long from Victoria to Courtney. And that's the, that's the section that we will focus on because that's the one that would bring the most immediate benefit to people along the length of the corridor. So one of the reasons, another reason why um, a fast train or a rapid transit corridor isn't practical because of the 236 level crossings. So that's crossings across streets, across driveways, across farm accesses that make it so that the train has to go slowly through those areas uh, because there's, there's people, there's traffic, there's livestock, there's wildlife. Um, so it really is not practical for high speed rail. There's also the 64 kilometer long spur um, from Parksville to Port Alberni, which is also very important, um, but obviously it does not connect the same number of people and communities that the one from Courtney to Langford does. So there's five regional districts, which includes towns and cities and municipalities, as well as 14 First Nations, 67 bridges and trestles. And since 2011, it has had very little use. There is still one active portion in the Nanaimo between the Nanaimo and an industrial park um, in sort of North Nanaimo. And that's the only sort of current use of the, of the tracks. So what about First Nations? <clears throat> well, to me, this is really, really important and, and it's critical. So the history of this, uh, you can see on the map, that area that's in yellow, that's, that's the, the ENN land grant that was land that was given to the Dunsmuirs in, in exchange for building that railroad. And, uh, and of course, this is all land that was stolen from the First Nations. And, and before that happened, the First Nations had already been stuck onto these little postage stamps of reservations and, and subjected to all kinds of indignities. Um, and then the, the railroad came along and of course the path of least resistance just happened to be right through the middle of many of those reservations. So you can see the purple stars, those are the reservations that the, the railroad took a hundred foot swath right through the middle of those, of those communities. And, uh, and then they had, so they had trains running right through their backyard on these tiny little bits of land that were called reservations. Um, so I think that that was just another indignity that was added to them. So, so as far as we're concerned, they have to be key players in whatever happens with this rail corridor moving forward. So we are dedicated to working with First Nations and, and making this corridor work for them, whether it ever has trains on it again or whether it becomes an active transportation corridor. And we're hoping that they see the benefit to their communities um, from a safety and active transportation and opportunities for trade and commerce that might come from a from a trail if it were to become established. So in 2020, the BC government Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure commissioned a report on the South Island Transportation Strategy, which included uh, the Couch and Valley and up to Langford and um, Vic West and Souk and on all of the communities basically south of, um, of the Cowichan Valley and including the Cowichan Valley. And they came up with a highest priority of active transportation as a way to move people, to reduce congestion, to improve public health, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, so that was their, their number one. Um, also high on the list was buses, more buses, better bus lanes and moving more and more people, getting people out of their cars and onto public transit. And then at the other end of the spectrum was the lowest priority items was a, a commuter rail between Vic West and Langford into Victoria. So connecting Victoria and Langford. Um, and the price tag on that was $595 million. And, and based on the estimated ridership, um, that would, come to about $500,000 per daily passenger, which is an investment that is pretty significant and why it was deemed to be lowest priority. And nowhere is there any mention of rail anywhere north of Langford. So that didn't even show up on the radar as something worthy of consideration. And we'll talk about why that might be. So the, 
They also did a corridor condition assessment, uh, same ministry in, in 2020. And that was a, um, an assessment of the current condition of the rail bed and the costs to restore it. Um, so you can see on that table there, to bring it back to its more or less original state was gonna be 213 million. Um, and, and of course, the reason it was abandoned was because it was not practical or profitable to run it in that current state. So phase two is the one that we're kind of using as a comparison uh, to bring it up to something better than what it was so that they could move more people and move more freight on it. And the price tag for that was $377 million. And that's, that's just from the coastal corridor, doesn't include Port Alberni, doesn't include um, the extension into Vic West. So here's a, here's a bit of an illustration of it and, and the costs that were associated with the various sections. So 377 million, we said, for uh, Courtney to Langford. Um, that's 1.8 million per kilometer. The section out to Port Alberni, because it's quite a bit more mountainous, there's more bridges and, and more uh, significant terrain features, that was gonna be $2.3 million per kilometer. So, so quite expensive. And then we already touched on the, the Victoria to Langford one, we won't use that one in any of our cost comparisons, the um, $595 million, um, because <clears throat> we're just really talking about wanting to open up. They already have good trail networks in um, Victoria. So we're just wanting to open up the rest of the island corridor for active transportation. So rail with trail is the idea that's being pushed by the Island Corridor Foundation. And, and of course, we know there are examples of that and we'll look at some, but there's significant obstacles to that. Uh, tunnels, for example, uh, you can't put a trail beside the tracks going through uh, the tunnel. Um, hanging trails on the sides of trestles is apparently um, not practical. So it would mean building new bridges and new trestles to accommodate the, the trail. Um, and there's 40 of them. There's 40 bridges and trestles between Langford and Courtney, and then uh, 19 on the Port Alberni Spur. So if we look at those obstacles, uh, the trestles, the tunnel, and then we've got steep banks, we've got rock cuts, we've got wetlands, we've got all of these things that would make it impractical, and in some cases, border not impossible, which would mean that at, to get around those sections, those obstacles, the trail would have to jump off the tracks, jump off to some pavement someplace, and then find a place where you could get around the obstacle and then jump back on, onto the trail. So it would be <clears throat> difficult to keep it continuous. Um, and the ICF have stated that in cases where there is not, it is not practical or possible to go beside the rail, there will be no trail. So, so they have been quite um, adamant about the tracks will remain in place. And if that makes it so you can't have a trail, then there just won't be one. So, so there are examples uh, in the Cowichan Valley and in Victoria and other places where they have built trails beside the rails. And of course, we're aware that that's happening in Shawnigan right now. There is, there is some um, rail trails being made uh, from um, uh, can't remember the park to the village. And, and there's also, there's the Cowichan Valley uh, Trail. There's the, the Friendship Trail is the one that goes from Duncan out to the Cowichan Commons. And then there's numerous other ones. So there's, there's a total of 34 kilometers of trail that have been made beside the, the corridor and, and 13, uh, 34 of them along the coastal corridor. So it's expensive to do that. Um, here's some examples of some of the, the trails with rails that have been built. And you can see that the costs go anywhere from 3 million, 3.5 million, almost 4 million per kilometer. And, and on the low end of the spectrum, you've got them as low as um, 300,000 per kilometer. Uh, so in that, in that range, 250,000 per kilometer. So very, very expensive to put trails beside rails. And why is that? Well, because um, the ICF has got specific requirements about trail crossings for railroad tracks. 
So you have to have them flagged, you have to have them marked, you have to have them um, up to the standards of pedestrian and cycle crossings for, for rail. And on the left, you can see um, you need, if there's uh, ravines or culverts or bridges that have to be crossed, you have to build a new bridge to accommodate the, uh, the bicycles. And uh, here's uh, some examples in Victoria. Um, you can see that there's a beautiful trail that's been built there. And you can see the derelict rail bed on the left-hand side, just continuing to be disused and rotting and rusting away. Um, so here's some examples of the cost as well. Uh, $2.1 million per kilometer and because it was all beside, they had to they had to make their own crossings across wetlands and across uh, ravines. And it's not particularly mount particularly mountainous in this region. So probably that's it would be more expensive to do that in other reaches of the trail. But but if we use that number, 2.1 million per kilometer for the remaining 180 kilometers of the corridor between Lineford and Courtney. Um, you're looking at $378 million to build a trail alongside the railroad tracks, the, the length of the, of the coastal corridor. So if you look at that, if you look at the, the business case, rebuild the railroad for $377 million and then put a, a trail beside it uh, for the remaining part that hasn't have, doesn't have a trail yet, $378 million. You're looking at three quarters of a billion dollars. And of course, that's all taxpayers' money. Um, it, it's not going to magically appear from any place. And there just does not seem to be any interest in senior government of getting involved in that kind of an investment when the predicted ridership and use of it is, is not that high. And of course, as I said earlier, any profits from operating that as a commercial enterprise would go to the US-based um, Southern Rail. So rail to trail is what we are advocating. And of course, we're all familiar with the Kinsall Trestle. It's beautiful. It's a great place to go out and recreate. And uh, there's some scenic vistas. But one of the problems with it is that it's really a trail to nowhere. It doesn't connect any of our communities. It doesn't really provide the opportunity for trade and commerce um, that something like the Galloping Goose does in Victoria. Um, the Galloping Goose is used by thousands of people, sometimes thousands of people in a day, I would, I would guess. It's a huge commuter and gets people out of their uh, vehicles and, and onto their feet and onto their bikes. And, uh, and it has become a huge, huge community asset. And in the Couch and Valley here, I don't know if very many of you have ridden or walked the, the trail that now goes from Sherman Road all the way up to Lake Couchin on one of the spurs of the old ENN. It's a magnificent trail. Uh, it's a great ride from Duncan up there to you know um, lunch at the pub and ride back again. And the cost of putting that in were thirty thousand dollars per kilometer. So by comparison, it's 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 ten times less to a hundred times less per kilometer to put a trail onto an existing rail bed. And some of the reasons are is that it's already there. It's already compacted. The crossings, the swamps, the rock cuts, everything is already in place. So this is just some pictures of the work to put in the, the Couch and Lake Trail um, on the old e and rail bed. And, and even though some of the conditions that they did it in were challenging, it still came in at $30,000 per kilometer compared to the, the other estimates for, for trails beside rails of 300 to 3 million per kilometer. So, so there's a huge cost difference. And uh, so if we were gonna look at the conversion of the entire ENN corridor um, using $100,000 per kilometer as our figure, not, not the $30,000 that actually was required for the Couch and Valley Trail. But if we use a higher number, $100,000 per kilometer, and, and we've got uh, rails that could be salvaged um, at using an estimate of $200 per 10, that would be a credit of, of $3.9 million. So the total cost to complete that rail system, and this is not 
an official cost. This is estimate based on our, our best guesses. There has not been an in-depth study done yet, but it would be $14.1 million is our estimate or 78,000 per kilometer. And we do consider that to be a, a high estimate. And an annual maintenance cost, there would be little to no need for subsidies for that because we've already got multiple agencies, uh, trail stewardship groups that would leap at the chance to have such a, an a asset in their community. And, and there is revenues from the right of ways along the trail where there is uh, cables and pipelines. And every time there is a legal crossing, there is a, there is a, um, a lease agreement for that. So there is revenues that could support the maintenance of a, of a trail. Um, so we think that the opportunity is just waiting to be seized. And what about the benefits of a trail? Well, um, connectivity is one of the big ones. For me, uh, climate change and sustainability is the driver. It's a way to get people out of their vehicles. I used to ride my bike from Cobble Hill into Duncan on a regular basis and riding alongside Dugan's Lake on the highway. I considered that to be a near death experience every time I did it. Um, and so I think that people would ride in multitudes between Shawnigan Lake and Cobble Hill and Couch and Station and, and Duncan. It would become a huge commuter route. And I believe that now with the advent of e-bikes, <clears throat> that there would be a tremendous amount of commuting from South Couch into Victoria during the, the nice weather. Um, because the slopes are very gentle. It's only 3%. You can hardly even tell you're going up a hill when you're on a rail grade. So, so it's really um, very, very attractive. And I think that, that it would be very well used. And then, and then it would support people and communities. Uh, can you imagine the artisan opportunities, the bed and breakfasts, the restaurants, the campgrounds, um, the First Nations uh, artisans? Um, there's just so much opportunity for business and tourism which, you know, that's not my number one, but um, I know Rotary Clubs are very, very big on supporting local businesses. And I, and I can just imagine the boom in local businesses that would come from having this as a really, what would be a world-class um, active transportation corridor. And so what, what are the governments looking at? Well, governments are looking at public transit. They're looking at buses, they're looking at bus lanes. Um, and they're going to be electric, and that's one of the that's one of the arguments against going with um, with rail is because it will be diesel trains. To electrify the corridor would mean a huge additional input into infrastructure. It would have to be either overhead electrical, or it ha would have to be electrical in the rail grade, um, which would mean charge uh, conductors in the rail bed, which like they use on subways. But of course, that would be too dangerous for, for level crossings. So until some such times as somebody comes up with battery powered trains, which you know I can't rule that out as a possibility, but it certainly isn't a reality in today's world. Um, so there, if, if that $377 million that they're talking about to restore the rail corridor were invested in buses, that would put 300 electric buses on the road. Can you imagine what that would do to relieve traffic and congestion and um, improve air quality through, through our cities? Um, so, so it's becoming a reality. Um, electric buses, public transit are things that are the focus of, of senior government and rail on a small scale like what we've got is just not on the radar. And then, of course, climate change. Um, diesel trains are not what we're looking at. Um, putting more vehicles on the road is not what we're looking at. We, we've got options now for moving freight. Um, I haven't seen any on the road yet, but there's, but there's many big truck companies that are looking at building uh, diesel semis. And, and of course, um, electric vehicles are, are everywhere now. Um, so it would seem like a giant step backwards to to put diesel trains back on those tracks. And, and we just think it's a different time. Um, the Island Corridor Foundation was formed in 2003, but, but there, there isn't the industry anymore to be served. And if it was gonna, if we were gonna move freight on those, on those rails, 
they would have to be hauled by truck to the tracks and then loaded onto the tracks and then they would have to be offloaded and back onto trucks to be distributed and delivered in the communities and it just doesn't make any sense for the for the length of haul and the amount of goods that would have to be moved on on this corridor and uh, and of course people are looking for places to ride now e-bikes are everywhere and for they make it so that people of, of a huge range of physical capabilities can actually get out and get exercise and fresh air and, and uh, enjoy the opportunity to recreate and commute um, in the fresh air. So again, I really think that, that kudos need to be given to the people who had the vision to secure that corridor for future generations but I think that they need to have another look at it and, and just get outside of that focus that it has to be trains or nothing on the corridor. So there was a, a study commissioned by our group and 800 survey respondents said that they are very much in support of, of uh, trails, that it's important to their lifestyles, that it would influence their travel plans, that if there was gonna be trails, they should be continuous without having to jump on and off um, the trail onto the pavement. And they were willing to pay. That, I mean, that's really important. People think that it is worth tax dollars to support something like this. So there's a huge amount of enthusiasm, we believe, in the community to be tapped um, towards this initiative. And here is, oops, let's go back one. Uh, here's an example of the Pennsylvania Gap or the Great Allegheny Passage. Um, that is a very comparable corridor, 241 kilometers long, 37 communities connected, and the, the trail is estimated over its length to attract 100 million, sorry, 1 million visitors a year. And that's most of them are from in state. So there are people who come from out of state to use it, but most of them are from the state. Um, and the average spending uh, in 2014 um, made it so that they estimated there was $185 million spent in the community. But there's a current estimate out now that in 2019, before the pandemic, that total bumped up to 121 million. Um, no, oh, I think I've got something out of whack here on my on my numbers. I, I think it was I just transposed that one, so I think it might have been two two hundred and eleven million dollars. Uh, but I'll have to uh, I'll have to revisit that. Uh, but anyways, a tremendous amount of money is being brought into the community during the pandemic. They feel there was more people on it, but they spent less money because businesses were closed and there was less opportunity to interact with with uh, people. But but anyways, it has been a huge boon to these communities. And of course, this corridor is beautiful. Some of our other rail corridors have their beauty, but they just are not nearly as scenic as this one. Um, here's uh, Bright Angel Park, the tracks up above uh, the park. Um, views of Mount Prevost, the Nanaimo Green Lake, the ocean views all along the corridor and the river views. Um, beautiful, beautiful places. And here's an example of a of an artisan business uh, up at Union Bay who would uh, who would probably love to have people coming through there and, and stopping for coffee and and uh, uh, donuts on the on the beach. And of course, here's what the trail is descending into now. Um, I don't know if this has been fixed yet, but but within the last 12 months, this was the state of the tracks uh, just south of um, of Shawnigan Lake. Um, Actually, I guess it's um, just north of the South Shawnigan crossing near Shawnigan Station. Um, and so, you know, it is it is just wasting away. So what can you do? Well, you could uh, you could visit us. Um, you could find out more. This presentation with a lot more slides and a lot more information is right on the front page of our website. So you can go through it and, and dig a little deeper. Uh, and of course, you could reach out to people in the community, decision makers, and get them on side for this. Writing letters is a great idea. Um, and of course, you can get connected with us. Uh, www.fortvi is our website address. And, uh, and we encourage people to visit and we encourage people to join. 
Um, our, we have a princely sum of a $5 a year membership, and we would really, really like to see more members. We have around a couple of hundred now, and, and we do accept donations. We don't really have a, a revenue stream apart from our uh, membership and donations. And, uh, and please uh, reach out to me uh, if you want to contact me and find out more information, please do so. I am one of the few remaining people who is still in the phone book, David Slade in Cobble Hill. And, uh, and that is my, uh, my email address, dslade at telus.net. And I would be more than happy to entertain any questions if there, if there were any and if you had time for them. Absolutely. Well, thank you, David. And we do open the floor for questions at this time. And if you uh, feel uh, you'd like to ask it in person, you can unmute or raise your hand and go ahead. And we can do this uh, by order of, of um, timing, or you can type it into the chat and I'd be happy to read it out. I see there's two, two things in the chat. Uh, nope, just comments. Okay, there you go. Um, I had a question. I, I can't remember the exact details, but I understand that the Nanus Bay uh, tribes have gone to court. Um, yes, yes, I can elaborate on that. Um, so the, the Nanus First Nations feel that if the tracks are not going to be used, then they should get the land back. And they went to court to try and accomplish that. And the courts, um, said uh, no, uh, the, the rails are there, it has not been abandoned, they appealed it. Uh, the, the appeals court said the same thing, but the appeals court said this cannot be an indefinite situation. And, and the appeals court gave the Island Corridor Foundation 18 months, and I think there is 14 months left in that now since the decision, 18 months to come up with a business plan and a funding formula to resurrect rail on that corridor, or the Nanus First Nations can go forward with their claim on the, on the corridor. And we realize that there is the potential if that happens, and, and they were also joined by the Couchin, and I think the Halalt also um, wanted to join that lawsuit, uh, but they were, they were actually told that they couldn't be part of the lawsuit, but that the lawsuit would decide the same thing for all of them, um, if in fact, you know, if and when the decisions were made. So, so they all have expressed the desire to get that land back and then to do with it as they see fit if it's not going to be used for rail. And our hope is that if that does happen, if they do get the land back, because I don't believe there's going to be trains running on that track in 18 months or 14 months, and I don't believe there's going to be a business plan to make us believe that that will be a reality. We hope that we can convince the First Nations all along the corridor that it would benefit them to have a trail go through their reserves. Now, the corridor is 100 feet wide. Um, a trail certainly does not need 100 feet of width. Uh, 20 feet would be more than enough. And the trail wouldn't have to uh, follow the rail bed necessarily through the reservations if the First Nations felt there was a more appropriate path through the reservations for the for the trail to to follow but worst case scenario is that you would have to jump out onto the pavement and go around the reservations which happened on some of the rail corridors in victoria uh, and there's only probably a total of two kilometers of the trail that actually goes through the reservations so it would not be a huge inconvenience and they're all located in areas where there's lots of access to pavement. So it wouldn't be a huge inconvenience to have to jump out onto the pavement for a kilometer, maybe on the highway, maybe on a side road and, and then get back onto the trail again once you got around the reservation. But that is, that is a reality that um, within less than two years, uh, a decision will have to be made and, and it's possible that some of those rail sections through the reservations will no longer be a contiguous corridor for rail traffic. But if that happened, the island corridor would still own the rest of the... Yes, there, there has been no claim or suggestion of claim for traditional territories, which would encompass all of the rail corridor. 
um, just the part that goes through the reservation. So there's still, you know, large stretches of it which do not go. So, so from from Duncan all the way to uh, Langford, it doesn't go through any reservations uh, apart from the Cowichan tribes right at the uh, edge of Duncan. Um, so so Cowichan Station, Cobble Hill, Shawnigan Lake, all of those communities could still be connected by rail um, with Victoria if that ever became a reality and, and the section through the reservations was lost. So your hope is if that doesn't happen that you convince the Island Corridor Foundation to go ahead with your plan? Yes, well, yeah, they're the ones that own and, and manage the corridor. So we're hoping that that if they come to the realization that um, rail is not going to happen, then uh, then they will embrace the idea of, of maintaining that corridor for the use of active transportation in whatever form they are able to maintain it, which may mean that there will be some some gaps or some changes to it through the reservations. On the Island Cor Corridor Foundation site, it says that Couch and Tribes is like 50% owner or it was their idea to, to do this. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, the, so when the, what they, were, um, they were instrumental in forming the, the Island Corridor Foundation and preserving the corridor because they saw the value in it. Um, so, so they, and, and also, and this may even be, have been a larger factor, they wanted to have a say in what happened on that corridor. And so they are, they're partners in the management and, uh, and I guess ownership of the corridor now as being uh, members, active partners in the Island Corridor Foundation. So yes, they, they were, but they have told me um, that, that they, um, that they could support in principle, a conversion to trails if they got control basically ownership over the corridor where it goes through the reservation. Thanks. Uh, Sharon has some comments, David, in the chat. She has been writing to her local representative and is wondering if, uh, in light of very little response, if anything, if she should go via her MLA and MP. Um, I would think that that would be um, valuable because there is going to be there is going to be active lobbying that takes place. Really, we're we're in a bit of a holding pattern now until that that um, appeals court decision uh, reaches the end of its date, the 18 months that they were given to come up with a plan. Um, so, so at the end of that, um, we want to be in a position where there is public support, where there is political understanding of the the desire to move this forward quickly, because it's something that could happen in a year. Most of that corridor could be converted to an active transportation corridor. Does anyone else have a comment or a question? I'm entering um, something into the chat. It was a YouTube video that I was directed to earlier this week. So um, it is possible to hear what the ICF is uh, recently as um, this past month said about their plans for moving freight on, on this line. And as you have well explained and illustrated, David, they're up against some enormous challenges with that plan. Hi, Kim. I, I have a question. I, I'm For some reason, I can't put my hand up. Can I, can I ask a question? Of course. It's, it's Russ to Dave. David, uh, my property... Um, is divided by the railway. I have what's called the hook parcel. I live actually right next door to, to Heather Plum. And the um, the original grant I've, I've gone and, and, and got from the uh, land titles vault, the original grant between the Esquimalt uh, and Nanaimo Railway Company and, and George A. Perrin, way back in 1890, there was a covenant and a reservation that the, the owners of the land will be able to enter upon, occupy, hold, enjoy this land forever. And of course, if, if a, a rails with trails goes through, that would be um, completely frustrated because they want to, they'd have to put up a fence according to their plans to protect people from getting knocked down by trains that haven't run since 2011. But I'm just wondering, you said earlier that um, that the trail the, the trail couldn't possibly go through certain um, First Nations reserves. 
and it it's possible that it might not be able to come through our land either because of this covenant and reservation for railway purposes through the land not mm -hmm. not trail purposes i'm wondering have you have you looked at that um yes and no um we have not had a lawyer dig deep into it i, I do I do empathize with lake shore property owners and and I know um, if I was one of them and, I, and I've actually seen the documents you talk about, I, they they uh, were forwarded to me via the Plum family um, and uh, and I would feel the same. I mean, in, in a perfect world from, from your perspective, uh, there, there wouldn't be trains running through your front yard and there wouldn't be a trail running through your front yard that might take hundreds or thousands of people, right? across your viewscape and really across your property. So I can certainly sympathize and empathize with that. And what the, you know, how the long arm of the law would feel about it ultimately, I don't know. I, I just do know that there are precedents all over Canada, uh, British Columbia, you know, the Okanagan trails, the ones, uh, the one from Lake Houchen, um, that went through, you know, multiple private properties all the way up to the lake. So I don't really know what the, the fine legal implications are, but I certainly do empathize um, with you. I, I, you know, I live right underneath the flight path um, for the the main approach to Victoria, and I and I get a lot of planes flying over my head, which I don't appreciate. And when and when we um, built on our property, we had to realign property lines, which meant that I had to sacrifice a piece off the front of my property that would one day hopefully accommodate. Um, pedestrian traffic or an actual cycle path so that people didn't have to, to ride right on Cobble Hill Road when they're when they're commuting. So I, I I do certainly empathize and I can understand how it would be something that would be less than appealing either to have you know 15 trains a day running through your backyard or to have um, hundreds of people going through your backyard. And I guess it's you know what what are the lesser of evils? Um, I don't know. It is obviously something I've forwarded um, your the the deed information to the rest of our um, our group, and uh, we're going to be deciding at our next meeting whether or not we have the financial resources to actually have lawyers dig into it and look for case precedents around around the country. But but it is you know that's something that is a of significant concern um, to us from our um, our objectives and of course to you and other uh, Lakeshore property owners. Well, David, I mean, thank, thank you for, David, can you hear me? Yes, I certainly can. Yes. Um, you mentioned there was precedence um, in Lake Cowich. I, I've looked hard at this and I cannot find any examples anywhere where the um, where rails with trails or, or even trails have gone through a hooked parcel. And that's what we have. Um, a, one of my lot, my par properties and Heather's as well. It actually divides the, our property. So as to leave a piece of our land on either side. And I've, I'm unaware. And, and unless you can share with me, um, are you aware of any of, anywhere on the island where that is, or anywhere in Canada, actually that's happened. Oh, well, actually I do, I do know that it did happen on that Lake Couchin trail, but in the end it happened, the happening was a benefit for the people who owned it because it made it so that they could subdivide the property into two pieces. It was only one title and they were able to go through the subdivision process solely because of the fact that it had that rail corridor going through it. Um, but, um, you know, they didn't. They didn't try to. Um, they didn't try to to protest or. And maybe the terms of of their lease or easement is different than the terms of your lease or easement. So I, you know, I really can't speak to that. Um, I guess I just know that the that the trails, very extensive and contiguous trails, exist um, all over North America, um, including including in British Columbia. The Okanagan Trail would be an example. And they actually just did some more rail trails in. The Okanagan, which go right along several lake shores. So, so whether or not the property, any properties are bisected, I, I really can't speak to that, but it is going to be something that the courts ultimately are going to have to decide, I'm sure. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Russ. And I'm seeing some uh, related comments in the chat, David. Um, Lori says that there are examples here at the lake where properties have that hook um, situation. And Sharon is asking as well um, if the CVRD can go ahead with their uh, expansions before the deadline for the island corridor. Well, I guess the CVRD has got deeper pockets than we do, obviously. <laughs> Um, so, so they can afford the legal, um, the legal muscle that it will take to actually uh, make a decision on their behalf, or even to take it to court if it comes to having to go to court. So, so yes, I, I really I can't speak to that. Um, what the CVRD can or is willing to undertake as far as uh, trying to overcome resistance to the rail with trail, and I and I understand. In fact, um, Ms. Plum told me that her resistance to rail with trail will be the same as the resistance to um, just the trail, um, rail without trail, or trail without rail. Um, and I can understand that. I, I really honestly do empathize with that, with that uh, position that people would find themselves in. Thank you, David. And I see, we, I believe we have David Hutchinson on the call. Uh, oh, and Aurora has her hand up as well. Thank you, Aurora. So uh, David, just be in the wings there, David Hutchinson, if, if you have any comments towards this. So go ahead, Aurora. Um, actually, it's Pat. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. My granddaughter's name on there. Um, it's great to have you. My question is, do you, does your group, thank you, does your group have another proposal for what would happen uh, transportation wise for the Malahat Highway, especially with the closures recently, there's always um, people wanting another route for cars and transportation through. If we didn't use the rail line for that, what would you, what would you propose to take care of that when we have at least 22,000 cars and vehicles going down there back and forth every day? Rather than building another road and all that would cost, what would be your suggestion there. Thank you. So, uh, so that is certainly something that that we have thought about. Um, but the reality is that I, I don't think that a commuter rail would do much to alleviate a, a an obstruction on the Malahat any more than the Mill Bay Ferry does, because you're not suddenly going to find um, hundreds of new trains to put on there to move people rapidly back and forth. It's only a single track, so you can't have trains going in both directions, except for where they can pass, where there's where there's sidings. Um, but I believe that it's quite possible that if you rebuilt the trestles and the and the uh, crossings up to a certain level, probably a, a lot less than the three hundred and seventy-seven million dollars investment to put trains on it, you could still use it for emergency vehicle traffic. So you might not move fire trucks on it, but ambulances, police cars, and and uh, personal vehicles could be could do one way traffic on the. If I, you know, if you look at the the trail up to Lake Cowichan or or the uh, the trail along the ENM or the, along the Kinsall uh, Trail there, there isn't room for two way traffic, but there certainly is room for one way traffic. And so it it seems very conceivable to me that you could have an hour of traffic going in one direction controlled and then an hour of traffic going in the other direction controlled and and or have pilot cars that would take um, convoys of vehicles through there. So it seems to me it could still be an emergency transportation route if we got the tracks out of the way. Um, so I, I can see that as a possibility. Um, it's not something that we're in a position to pitch as a reality because there would have to be significant investigation into the integrity of the of the trestles and that kind of thing and as to what kind of traffic and load they could carry. But it doesn't seem unreasonable to me that it could provide emergency transport opportunities for vehicle traffic in a limited sense when the Malahat was closed, far more so than I think trains could do and and certainly more so than the than the bus or than the ferry could do. Uh, Thank Kim, you. Uh, hello, Kim, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Dave Hutchinson here. Sorry, my camera's not working, but you were asking what my thoughts were. Uh, absolutely. Uh, 
uh, thanks for asking. I um, I tuned in late, but everything I, I heard in the last 15 minutes, I agree with what David Slade has said. I'm an electric bike owner, so um, I'm, you know, I'm interested in, in it as a trail. And I think that the uh, CBRD is, um, there, there's better uses for the money that they intend to spend on that next portion of the trail, given that I agree with David that I don't think trains will ever be running on there again. My, I have commented on occasion that it would be in the public interest to preserve ownership, public ownership of the complete corridor for maybe you know decades down the road when an overhead electric um, rail of some sort might be possible. I have no idea what David thinks about that. It, it sounds a bit space age, but who knows? Anyway, that's all I've got to say, but thanks for asking. Thank you. And David, I believe you spoke to the, the, the dream of battery powered trains, perhaps. Yeah, well, that's, that's another smoky, smoky train dream that, uh, you know, maybe that could be a reality. There is something that exists in the States. And as far as we know, there's no example of it in Canada yet. It's called rail banking, where they have got a legal status of a rail bed that maintains the continuity of that rail bed and preserves it for a time someday in that hazy gray future when trains might run on it again. So, so it's, it's, it's called rail banking and we're, we're looking into whether that's a possibility or whether, whether legislation exists or whether legislation could be created so that um, the, the rail bed corridor could be preserved regardless of whether it becomes a, a trail or not, but it could be preserved in perpetuity um, for the return of trains, if that ever becomes um, feasible or desirable. Um, and that might be a way to preserve the corridor, um, even through First Nations. But uh, again, I want to emphasize that I want to respect First Nations and that whatever decisions are made are decisions that should be supported by the per affected First Nations. Thank you, David. And I'm keeping one eye on the time. I want to thank everyone who's participated in this presentation and the following discussion. And this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to share my screen with additional contact information because I really believe that the function our Rotary Club can serve is of uh, creating a space and a portal where we can share resources and continue this discussion and be able to um, facilitate understanding and collaboration and I think even uh, you know be a peacemaker in that regard that we can bring everyone to the table and that is something Rotary is known for so let me just go to the very last slide so you can see and I would encourage people to be part of the show. change if you if you join our group um, that will be something that you can do on the ground for the princely sum of five dollars a year membership <laughs> and we would wel welcome as many new members, uh, Rotary and otherwise, as, uh, as we could gather. Fantastic. And on that note, I'll put in a plug for being a part of an eco club because it's probably the lowest entry, cheapest, most frugal entry into Rotary. It's $5 a week, and that covers your volunteer insurance as well. So what a deal. <sighs> So you can follow our stories uh, in our videos and our social media. We have a YouTube channel. It's just called Shawnigan Rotary. It's very easy to search and find. Our Facebook page is Rotary Club of Shawnigan Lake Eco Club. And we're always um, posting content that may be of interest to members and guests alike. And our Instagram is Shawnigan Rotary Eco Club with the dots in between. And that allows us to connect with the, a global scene. And through that, we're able to keep in touch with what other clubs are doing. And we recently even connected with an eco club in Turkey. And that presentation is on our YouTube channel as well. We like to send tweets occasionally, so that's there. But most importantly, please visit our website because there's information on how to join the club. And we have upcoming events listed there as well. And I will uh, cut to that website so that you can see an example of that. Oh, here's our wheel. I'm sorry. Let's exit full screen and we'll call up the Shawnigan Rotary Club's website so you can get a sense of where to click. So upcoming events today in Shawnigan Lake. We'll end on that note. 
before we stop the recording. So we've got uh, Christmas in the Village and there's a number of voices on the call today that are participating in that. And the rest who couldn't make the um, presentation today, I'm sure are, are actively setting up for that as we speak. And we've also got some friendly neighbors doing light tours coming up. So you can find all of this, including um, what our uh, generous firefighters are up to. And lastly, there's an Eco Club member exclusive. So you'll want to uh, connect with uh, me, myself, Kim, for this treat. And as a thank you for your volunteer efforts this year. So to join us, if you want to learn more about how to become a member of the club, we have listed all the benefits in plain English for you here. There is no hidden fine print whatsoever. And you can find a copy of the application form once you understand the membership benefits. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing and stop the recording at this time.